session Tuesday, June 25th at 6 p.m. Please have a roll call. McGuire? Here. Michaels? Mitchell? Here. Petrie? Here. Quisenberry? Here. Richards? Rosales? Schrader? Schwartz? Here. Alex? Here. Berkson? Here. Carter? Coart? Esri? Here. Harper? Here. Hartke? Here. James? Here. Jay? Here. Kibler? Langenheim? Maxwell? Kurtz? Here. We have a quorum. Can I have uh, a motion for approval of the agenda, please? Mr. Maxwell, Mr. Esri, second. Thank you. Uh, any changes to the agenda? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Notice of the meeting, please. Notice is hereby given that a study session of the County Board Champaign County, Illinois will convene on June 25th, 2013, 6 p.m. in the Lyle Shields Meeting Room, Brookings Administrative Center, 1776 East Washington Street, Urbana, Illinois, for a presentation of the Commun Community Justice Task Force Report. Thank you. Uh, motion to uh, approve notice of the meeting. So moved. so moved, Mr. James. Second, Mr. Esri. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Before we go <clears throat> to our report, uh, just a few ground rules. Uh, first, uh, I want to take this time to thank this task force. This was more than a year uh, in work. Uh, I've gone through this uh, report. It's excellent. And I think uh, they need recognition. So I'm going to ask, um, I'm going to call off each name of the task force for the record so that the uh, Everyone in this room understands who took time out of their busy schedule for the hours upon hours of work that was placed in this report. First, I want to thank the chair, Ms. Astrid Berkson, for the work that she has accomplished now. And I wanted to thank um, Mr. Richards as the former chair and the work that was done uh, prior to uh, Ms. Berkson taking the chair of the Justice Committee. I also want to thank Carol Ammons, James Kilgore, Scott Bennett, Darlene Klopo, Bruce Sardini, Lynn Branham, Julian Rappaport, and William Sullivan on the current task force. There were three on the former task force that I think I need mentioning. Uh, that was Mark Driscoll, Shirley, Shirley, excuse me, Shirley Ferguson, and Benita Rollins Gay. I want to thank all of you for your public service and the time that you have rendered to this report. Uh, excellent job. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Uh, the task force has designated Darlene Klopel to bring us a report. Now, I know that there will be questions. Um, we have had this report up on the website for a number of days now, so some of you might have already formed some questions or comments. And what I'd like to do is have Darlene give us the entire report first. Once that's completed, I'll ask for questions from the floor. Any of the board members present today can ask questions of any of the task force uh, when, uh, when that uh, time occurs. Also, immediately following the report and questions and concerns and comments from our county board, we will have public participation. Any of you here who wish to participate in this procedure, we have a slip of paper back by the door. Please fill it out and bring it to the chair. I appreciate that as well. So I'd like to bring to the floor Ms. Darlene Kopel to uh, give us the report of the task force. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you for having us this evening. This has been um, a work in progress for some time and we're happy to bring you a final report this evening. Um, the task force um, this last six months was charged with three tasks. The first one being to research strategies to prevent incarceration, reduce recidivism, and promote rehabilitation of persons incarcerated in the jail. Um, we did a pretty 
thorough job of that, I think. Most of what you will see tonight was dealing with those three issues. Um, we were trying to come up with alternatives that would um, help folks stay out of the jail and also not go back to the jail once they had been there and were released. So um, you'll see most of the recommendations tonight will, will be addressing that. The second task that we were asked to do was to identify existing and potential strategies for reducing the risk of youth becoming juvenile or adult offenders. I believe that this task was added in January after the first um, members of the first task force presented their preliminary report. I think this was an added task and I will tell you that we spent very little time on this. Uh, we have a little bit of information about it which you will see in the report in the, mostly in the conclusion but um, we did not spend a lot of time on this. We just ran out of time. So I'm just letting you know that up front. There are um, other groups in the community that are working on this as um, the committee here is working on things. Some of those groups have been um, more, working more with juveniles. You may have heard of um, such groups as the Access Initiative or the Champaign Coalition more recently. Uh, perhaps you, you're not aware that there is a quarter cent administrative team that oversees the current 5% that's given from the public safety uh, quarter cent tax. Um, those groups have been involved with the juvenile system for some time, and so they are overseeing some of those um, activities that are going on with that. Um, and I think you'll find that um, if you investigate much further, we would, like, we would like there to be more investigation into that. There's still improvements to be made, but that they're kind of ahead of where the adult system is, and so this is kind of a catch-up for the adults to implement some of the things they may already have in place. The third task that we were asked to do was to work with the county's consultant on a final report, and we are doing that. Um, ILPP has seen the recommendations that we will be putting forth tonight, and they will be taking a look at those. Um, I think at your last board meeting, you talked about extending the deadline for that so that he could incorporate some of these things in his report. We've read through his draft. We think there's a lot of consistency between what his recommendations are and what we would like to recommend, and so um, we are happy to say that we think that that will be accomplished as well. Okay. Um, the way that we organized our report, for those of you that have had a chance to look through it, is that there's a summary section, the summary report, that covers you know, the first 21 pages of the report. Basically, we spent a lot of time trying to summarize down so that it was easy to read um, and concise for you all. The last 50 pages are what we call our full report. It's more expansion on the, full, on the summary. So it's basically more detail about the information that I will present tonight, more research. There's footnotes. There's things that you can look up from other communities. If you're interested in any particular area, you can look up some of those things afterward. But I'm going to focus tonight primarily on the summary report because that's the main meat of the recommendations. Okay. So let's start on page five um, with the first recommendation. This will be the introduction. This basically outlines what I've just told you. And then on page eight is beginning with the first recommendation. We basically ended up with 10 recommendations, a nice round number, um, and not too many, I think. So um, we're going to start with the first one. The first recommendation is to integrate restorative justice principles into the system of justice in our county. Um, many of you are familiar with restorative justice principles. Some of you might not be. The um, detail here gives more explanation about that. But basically, the um, idea is that it underpins everything else that we're going to recommend. All of the system components, all of the um, things that we're talking about being integrated, we, we hope that would be restorative in nature with the idea that we're considering the long-term result. Obviously, if someone commits a crime in our community, we want, that to, we want them to be held accountable for that. And so part of restorative justice is developing an accountability for the crime that was committed, the harm that was done. On the other hand, you do know that eventually the person will need to reenter the community, will need to reestablish their place in the community in a productive way. And so you want to, in the long term, make that happen or make that, make that easy to happen. Um, and so what we're saying is that in the restorative justice principles that will be integrated, that the um, sanctions that are offered will fit the crimes committed. There will be some negotiation with how those sanctions are developed so that in the end result, the person is accountable, has some kind of repairing of the harm that they've done, but in the long run, there's a way for them to restore their relationships 
and be able to reenter the community because they will be a part of our community and the question is do we want them to be a productive part or do we want them to recidivate? So that's kind of the underlying principle between all of our recommendations here. Okay, the next set of recommendations starts on page nine and that would be recommendations two through five. These are recommendations specifically about types of services and what we're calling the continuum of the system. So we're saying that there should be a continuum from the time that we do pretrial all the way through the time the person exit the criminal justice system to have some kind of a continuum of services that has a variety of options that would offer alternatives um, more than we have available to us right now in our existing services. So recommendation two has to do with pretrial services. We do have some existing pretrial efforts at this point, um, either through the state's attorney's office, through the prosecutor's office, or through the jail itself. However, we're recommending that we would want to organize those into a continuous sort of pretrial program that's more coordinated and comprehensive so that it really deals with all the pretrial issues. Um, what we're prim primarily promoting is that there be uh, uh, best practice risk assessment developed so that it's determined when a person is arrested and taken to the jail, perhaps, um, whether they are at risk for one of two things, either being a danger in the community or a danger of flight risk before their trial. And if either of those are high scoring, then they would be kept at the jail. And if they're not high scoring, that some alternative could be found for them awaiting their trial. Um, there are many options, and we've talked about a few of them in more detail in our report, um, but we're suggesting that there would be several people in our jail at any given time that would be potentially eligible for waiting outside the jail, but for some reason are in the jail because this assessment has not been done. Um, also, there needs to be some mechanism for pretrial supervision. Obviously, if people are awaiting trial outside the jail, you want to be sure that they're going to um, arrive for their court hearing. And so there's various levels of supervision that could be provided. And again, some of those alternatives are discussed with more detail in our report, but there's again a continuum. Not every um, solution would fit for every single person. So we're hoping that we can develop a few more options in that area. And that these would be coordinated and our, our um, proposal, we believe, would save costs from people that are currently in the jail that really don't need to be there on a 24-7 basis. Okay, then um, the next um, recommendation three is on page 11. We're talking here about expanding access to behavioral health services. Um, that would include both mental health, mental health and substance use by developing a coordinated system of care for community treatment, for crisis intervention, for in-jail services, and for pre- and post-incarceration transitions. Currently, again, we have pieces of this in place. Most of them are not well coordinated. I think that in Dr. Kalmanoff's preliminary report, he mentioned that. Um, we do have some um, you know, crisis services or obviously great interventions available in our community. We have good mental health services here. They're just not always coordinated for people coming and going in and out of the jail or for diverting people from the jail if that's the primary reason that they're in the jail. Um, it is true that there are people with mental illness that are danger and they should be in the jail because they need to be contained. So there needs to also be some mental health services provided in the jail as well as a diversion kind of opportunity. Um, we, we do, I would like to call your attention at your desk, there's a green sheet of paper that is a resolution that was recently passed by the Mental Health Board and I just wanted to mention that because work is already beginning um, from some of the funding that falls, flows through the Mental Health Board for uh, redirecting some of the mental health services that are funded currently to be able to better address some of the needs that the jail might have for that specific targeted population. It's an MOU that the Mental Health Board um, passed last month. So I just wanted to, to call that to your attention. Some things are already in progress. Another um, activity that's already in progress is as part of the um, efforts of the mental health providers in the community, community elements in particular, there has been a crisis center opened now to divert people, primarily to divert people from the emergency room, but also is now being used to divert some people as appropriate from jail admission um, for mental health type crises that get out of hand at the um, backside of Presence Hospital. It's called the Community Resource Center, and it is now being um, used. It's been open for about a month, and um, clients are being accepted there. So there's also a beginning of an emergency crisis response there. 
Um, there are other services that we would recommend also would include substance abuse and we used to have a detox center in our community. We no longer have a local center. The, the most, um, the closest one is several, a couple of hours away. And we would, you know, like to recommend that we try to look at having one back in our community as part of our emergency crisis response. Um, and then the fourth particular service that I want to mention is our drug court. Many of you, I think, are very familiar with our drug court in Champaign County. Um, occasionally there's a newspaper article that appears about the success of some of those folks. And um, that is a program that ha is a best practice and has been shown to have a long-term um, positive impact on the people that participate in it. So those are particularly some of the things. There are others. I mean, there are many other kinds of interventions that could be offered as options or could be coordinated better. And so I just wanted to mention some of them here. Um, the fourth recommendation appears on page, start on page 13. This recommendation has, um, as people are going further into the system, into the justice system, and maybe they've already received a sentence or there might be some kind of diversion option that could be offered, um, with drug court being one of those, but um, there could be other options for sanctions that would include fines, perhaps, or some kind of a day reporting center, or some kind of electronic monitoring. Again, the county does use each of these very, in a very limited way right now. They're not well coordinated. They're not always following best practices as far as um, the comprehensiveness or the kinds of folks that they're serving. And so we would recommend an expansion of these services in our county. Um, it's, it's obvious that if someone were going to a day reporting center, maybe also had electronic monitoring, that would be probably less expensive than um, sort of caring for them 24 seven in a, in a jail facility. Um, so again, these are things that can reduce the number of jail beds that would be necessary in the county, which again would help reduce costs. Um, another sideline, which will come up later, is that when you're caring for people 24-7 and responsible for their well-being, you also do need to be paying for their mental health services and their health services, which are very expensive. And so if people can maintain in the community their jobs, their own jobs, their own health care coverage, their own um, um, housing, those kinds of things, that it, would, it helps them not only in the long run when they exit the program, but it also helps them in the interim while we're trying to provide other kinds of um, sanctions for, for crimes that may have been committed. It's not appropriate for everyone. There still will need to be some people in the jail, of course, but there are many people for whom we feel that this would be appropriate. And the fourth, I mean, sorry, the fifth um, recommendation on the next page is about um, reentry on page 14. And what we're recommending here is that as people have come through the system and we've tried to provide these various ways of either diversion or providing sentences, there are still gonna be people in the jail that are gonna to need to re-enter back into the community, probably from the Department of Corrections. We're not necessarily talking about our own jail here, but people that have more serious crimes have been um, given, to, given to the Department of Corrections for their term of sentence and then come back to our community. And again, these are folks that um, currently there are a few small kinds of services in place. There's some transitional programs, et cetera, that are short term, but there, we feel like this needs to be beefed up a little bit. And so what we're saying is that if you have um, a lot of people going out of the community, being incarcerated for some number of years and then coming back to the community, basically they're given $50 and said, you're on your own. Um, the chances of them being able to reintegrate into the community are pretty slim. I have a small audience here. <laughs> okay. Um, so what we're, what we're suggesting is that a specific program be set up to, for reentry, that a connection be made with the Department of Corrections. And I, um, I know the department would be um, interested in doing that. They do have liaison officers at the Department of Corrections that are interested in reintegrating people in the community. Um, and so there would be a connection made there. There would be some kinds of services set up to help people obtain driver's licenses, um, um, state IDs, you know, kinds of things that they might need to get jobs, um, connect them with potential, potential employers that would be willing to hire them, um, find housing, um, reestablish credit, all those kinds of things. And you can imagine what an overwhelming task that would be for someone just coming out of prison. Um, they may have committed a very serious crime. They may have been in prison for a long time. They may not even know how to use some of the tools and equipment that are out there anymore with our cell phones and computers and different things that change over time. 
they may not even be familiar with how to do any of those common things that we think are common ordinary things. And so what we're suggesting is that there be a very um, formal program set up that we could help people with that in reintegrating. Obviously, we're still considering, go back to our restorative justice, the long-term goal is the people will be in the community. How do you want them to be in the community? Do you want them to be integrated and productive or sort of floundering and not able to accomplish what they need to to be able to move on with their lives? So those are the, those are the first uh, four um, recommendations that have to do with actual resources and services that we think should be provided. And then we move on to recommendation number six, Recommendation number six also sort of underpins all of these um, recommendations because it's requiring that they have adequate funding. And um, we, have a, we have talked about and presented in here a variety of options for funding. I know that the ones that the county board is probably going to be the most interested in and have controversy about are the, the first two that I'm going to mention, which are the quarter cent public safety tax. The task force is recommending that that be increased from its current 5%, which is supporting pretty much juvenile programs, to a 30% or more, which would support the adult programs as well. Um, and the other thing would be the general corporate fund. So those are the things the county board has control over directly, and so those are probably the things that will generate the most discussion here about whether they can be used or not. Other funds, however, are also available, and I just wanted to make you aware of a lot of those. Um, there are county-related funds that the county collects but are not directly funded through the mental health, uh, I mean through the county board. Those would be like through the mental health board money, the developmental disabilities board money, um, the Champaign County Regional Planning Commission. All receive funding from other places, either through county taxes or other places, that potentially might have similar goals to some of the programs of maybe some of the sanctions or pretrial options or things that can be established. And if that would be the case, those funds could be leveraged and used together to be able to make those things happen. Just as I just mentioned, some of the mental health board money is currently being used for a crisis center, to start up a crisis center. Um, other money that's available that we just were aware of as a task force that might be available out there for the state or the county to apply for would be state funds. For example, the, as I mentioned, the Illinois Department of Corrections has money sometimes that they would like to see various things happen. They're willing to support that financially. One of the things we think is possible would be something called the Adult Redeploy Illinois Grant. Um, this county currently doesn't get that money, so we think that's a possibility. Other counties do. Um, also, the Illinois Department of Human Services has monies available for, for specific targeted goals for specific targeted populations that might be available. Um, the other federal funds that might be available could come directly from other resources for specific activities. For example, you all are aware of Medicaid, and obviously Medicaid will pay for many behavioral health kinds of services, so if we can find ways to leverage that money for services that are being provided, we can, uh, we can acquire some of those funds here. Um, the Department of Health and Human Services, through its SAMHSA division, is also mental health and substance abuse related, and they are interested in funding local projects. In our county, for example, they currently fund the Access Initiative for the youth, so it's potentially possible there would be other programs for adults that they would be willing to fund. Um, the third department would be the Department of Justice. They also have grants that are available to states, then flow down through counties, or sometimes counties or cities directly can apply. And then um, HUD, which is the Department of Housing and Urban Development, um, has housing money that's available and sometimes can be targeted for specific populations with specific needs. So those are all potentially federal funding sources that could be looked at in terms of acquiring additional money or leveraging money that the county would put forward as local match. Um, other funds that we thought about that potentially could be used, often are used by local agencies, would be sometimes the cities are willing to put in money for a variety of reasons, and obviously that what we're talking about the entire county here, and so there are lots of smaller city jurisdictions that have money that's de designated for police um, or law enforcement kinds of things, or public safety or neighborhood development. Potentially they would have similar interests for some of the things that we would talk about. The University of Illinois is interested in training, and also there is a university police department, so um, they might have potential overlaps or links that could be used. There's private insurance from folks that are, have health care issues or mental health care issues that potentially private insurance could be used. Um, the community is, this community is very good. The whole county is always very good with volunteer efforts. There are lots of things volunteers could do. Um, 
In the youth programs, for example, the volunteers often do the mediations or are involved with the peer court, so potentially for the adult services, volunteers could be recruited for various things. Um, the local bar association has sometimes available grant monies that are available for specific projects. Um, if we're talking about doing fines of any kind for any kind of um, kinds of sanctions that we might have, potentially those fees could be used as revenue source for the programming. And then nationally, there are foundations that would be interested if we were doing specific kinds of if, if best practices or developing new services for the system or that kind of thing, some kinds of data collection efforts, um, public foundations and private foundations are sometimes willing to put money into that. So those are just things that we thought of um, that we know enough about to mention to you. There are probably more, but we thought we would bring those forth as possible funding opportunities in addition to what we know the county is going to have um, as on their table. The next um, series of recommendations have to do with strategies. So we've talked about the different services we'd like to see provided from entry to exit out of the jail or the justice system. And the next ones have to do with how you might structure oversight of that. The recommendation number seven on page 18 talks about system management. Um, we are recommending something called a coordinating council, a criminal justice coordinating council. Um, there's other terms that could be used for that, but basically it's a body that is set up through an intergovernmental agreement, um, also including private agencies that might be providing services, also possibly including public, the public. It could include, for example, victims and potentially people who had offended in the past. Um, to participate in planning services and oversight of services so that it makes sense. So that people are taking a look at it from a variety of perspectives, from a wide diverse perspective, just similar to our task force, and saying that these are different ways that we could approach this. We're going to take a look at how we're planning this. We're going to see if it actually makes sense to spend money this way, that sort of thing. And um, provide some oversight in the actual developing of implementation plans that would go on or service, service provision that would go on. High, you know, lower than the funding level, but maybe the next level down that would actually do some of the management of how that, that, how that happens. Um, as part of that, recommendation number eight talks about a racial justice task force, which could be um, a subcommittee possibly of the coordinating council. It could be a separate task force as well, but it makes sense to make it a, a subcommittee. And that would talk specifically about some of the racial disproportionality that we see in our justice system, not alone here in Champaign County, but across the nation. But we could address some of those issues here. And so we wanted to specifically not forget that in terms of looking at that when we're talking about what we would like the oversight to be about, um, that there could be specific uh, measures set up to measure that or specific services set up to address some of those issues. Um, the data collection is number nine, and that, that's on page 20. And of course, if you're going to try to manage a system, one of the issues that we found as a task force is that we do collect data in our county, but we again do not do it in a coordinated fashion. We don't do it in a way that shows a continuity so that we can really determine what's happening with any given person. We do it very piecemeal. Um, you may or may not be aware in this county that we actually have three databases for police data to be collected um, in the various police jurisdictions. Um, there are um, many other ways of collecting data. So um, what we find is that when we were asking data about whether certain things might be a best practice or whether they were working in our county, we had a difficult time really determining that because either data was not being collected about that particular measure or because it wasn't consistent over time or um, for lots of various reasons, there were gaps in the data. So um, we, would, we would suggest that the data collection and evaluation of, for system improvement be done through this coordinating council and that there be a plan for that and how that's going to be collected and then how that information will be used and it can be used to help develop system improvements over time. And then the tenth recommendation is about training for justice system partners and for the public. Uh, again, mostly about restorative justice principles, but also about any new changes that we might be recommending to the system. So if we're suggesting that we use a certain practice, there be training offered on that practice, that the public be informed that we're doing it, that it be an open and transparent uh, public engagement process, and that everybody's aware of you know, how the money's being spent and where it's going and whether, it's being, whether it is actually being effective. When we, we don't do a very good job reporting back about that last part. If we spend money on something, are we actually being effective at what we're spending the money on? Okay. 
And then just the last thing I would like to say in conclusion is talk a little bit about the impacts because obviously we're making these recommendations because we think that there would be an impact on the county in certain ways. And so some of those impacts, and you'll read those in the longer full report in various points of the recommendations, have to do with things like these. First of all, we see that there would be an increased efficiency among system components. Right now, it's not very efficient, for example, to refer people back and forth. The case managers lose track of where the person is. There's not a consistent way to collect the data, et cetera, et cetera. So there'd be more efficiency if you had um, the system components coordinated into a real system. We think another, the second impact would be decriminalization of poverty, homelessness, and mental illness. We have seen cases and have reported with all the officials that we've talked to various cases of people in those circumstances that are in the jail for the, basically because they either can't pay a fine, they're too poor to pay the fines, because they um, are on the street and homeless and they eventually get in trouble, or because they have a mental illness that creates eventually a criminal situation. But if those were addressed as the underlying causes, perhaps they would not end up in the jail to start with. And so we're trying to decriminalize reasons why people end up in the jail. We also think that there would be increased equity for racial minorities, and we talked a little bit about that with our racial justice task force and how that might be impacted. If we start implementing some of these things across more of a system approach, um, we think that that would help equalize some of the racial disparities. Um, increased focus of justice personnel on public safety. Obviously, we're paying our police officers and jail personnel very good salaries, and we would like them to be focusing on public safety. That's what we're paying them to do. And when they get distracted with um, other issues, like where do I put somebody that's mentally ill, or um, how can we assist someone that's homeless, or how are we gonna deal with people that really um, can't, can't be in the jail, but are just there for several days because they haven't been able to arrange for an attorney yet, or that kind of thing, then we realize that we're paying lots of money for things that are not related necessarily to public safety, but a lot of these peripheral issues, and spending a lot of time, staff time on those issues as well. So we're hoping that would increase the focus of the justice people on the, what they need to be concerned about, which is the public safety issues. And then increase effectiveness of program and system outcomes. As I was mentioning earlier, we were thinking if we spend a lot of money, we want to be sure we're getting good, good bang for our buck. So are we actually seeing good outcomes from what we are putting our money into? And then decreased recidivism, which was one of the goals of the task force, was to try to propose things to you that would reduce recidivism and repeat offenders. And we're thinking that many of the things that we have recommended would do that and reach that goal and have that impact on the system. So um, I thank you for the opportunity to address the board. This is a pretty quick overview. I tried to speak quickly but be clear. So we would be happy now to take any questions that you have, and I want to say the rest of the task force behind me, my, I might turn to them and ask them to answer the question instead of myself, but uh, we would be happy to entertain questions that you have about our report. Thank you, Darlene. I really appreciate that. Uh, I think just getting started, I think the Mental Health Board is starting to move in a positive way as well, right from your recommendations, and I think that's a, an excellent start. So. Uh, I congratulate you on already seeing some positive response to your report. Um, I'll open it up for questions to the board. Uh, comments or questions? Mr. Quisenberry. Yes, first of all, thank you all for your work on this. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a great body of work. I think it will integrate well uh, with Dr. Kalmanoff's uh, report to us, and we will we'll have some action items that we can take up and pursue. Um, a couple of questions. Um, first, um, I was looking at the salaries uh, for the positions that you recommend, and I'm curious, um, how did you arrive at the numbers that you arrived at? What, what's included in those, those estimates for salaries? I realize they're estimates. Um, originally, what we did was just say we, we, don't, we haven't done enough research on actual budgets to be able to come up with a line item budget. Of course, the majority of the cost would be the staff. And so we tried to think about a, an, an idea of what staff would be needed. And then we um, estimated a potential salary for that person in the, range, you know, in the tens ranges. So it would be like $50,000 or $40,000 for a salary and then doubled it, knowing that there would be fringe benefits, mileage costs, office costs, 
that's how we that's how we got most of those. Okay, numbers. so it, it's meant it's to estimate. represent the salary plus burden yes. associated with that yes. that staffing. Okay, thank you. Uh, one other thing I noticed as I was going through this, um, the the marginal summaries, um, for whatever reason, the the text size has pushed some of the content out of what's visible. So if we could get it reformatted and, and put back up it's a PDF. So if someone who has yeah. the uh, original could reformat it so all of that detail yeah, the could PD, be viewable. Yeah, the PDF will do that for you. If you get it, if you got the original, in the, was it the Word document that was off? No. Yeah, it, we it's had not to, viewable. We had to convert it to a PDF because many board members can't read oh, Word documents. Okay. So we converted it to a PDF. So we okay. can work on that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Oh, Mr. Oh, okay, Mr. James, please. Darlene, in your report on your conclusions, I, I think one of the questions I always have is when I hear some of the things uh, that, that's been put forth, and by the way, it is a good report, and I do appreciate it. Uh, a lot of this, when we're talking about some of the outcomes or things that we should do, I wonder, because state law sometimes dictates a lot to the field officer what he can and cannot do and how he must look at something when he's there. He has very... He's got some leeway, but very little. And, you know, some of the things you're talking about here, like the homelessness and some of the other things, if, if they go to a call, I'm not sure, but I would think that if there's a call, there has to be some sort of action, and their hands are somewhat limited. So uh, should some of this not probably be addressed with state legislators to change some of the laws that are existing on the books so it makes it easier for counties to do their job? I'm going to let Steve take that question. Oh, Scott, I'm sorry. Scott, yes. Scott, it is. Scott, please come Scott. up to the chair. <laughs> Thank you. There you go. Hi, I'm Scott Bennett. Um, yes, I mean, criminal statutes are, are, are state, but in, in almost all situations, officers have discretion. I mean, they're trained and they are... They have a lot of discretion as to well, does it rise to a criminal offense or is it just a welfare check or there's a whole lot of different things officers can do when they arrive on a scene, particularly if it's a mental health issue. Um, so I think what we tried to do is just give officers as many options as possible so that they really can use their discretion. They're not, because uh, one thing we hear time and again is that their hands are really tied. There's only so many things they can do in a situation where maybe a criminal statute was violated but it probably is just they want to get that person away from the, the scene, which is um, in which, every, you know, it's a heightened, a heightened scene. So um, I think that that's the issue. It's they still have a lot of discretion on the scene. Well, without naming names or anything, but I know of incidents where officers have allowed people uh, that weren't driving, but they were past the legal limit and then something has happened and then it ends up that that police department and or that county has been sued because they should have jailed that person after they had made contact with them. And what I'm hearing you say is this discretion, uh, and I read the paper, not religiously, but quite a bit, especially the News Gazette. Uh, I don't know if the field officer out there doing that after he's been, tr I, I just have a problem with that when the law, you know, gives them <laughs> only certain parameters. I don't think that we want to make our uh, officers judges when they're at a scene that they've been trained or they're within something. So that's where I have a little problem with some of this. And maybe if, if you go on with your work, you can research that a little bit more and really clarify, because I don't think a judge is going to say that you have that type of discretion. I would just say that it's still the state's attorney's position to say whether or not they're going to be charged. But they're on the scene. Officers are just looking to see if there's probable cause to make an arrest. And as uh, or off of the scene, if say for example, a person is causing a disturbance uh, at a in the emergency room, and officers come to the scene, uh, that's where the discretion kind of comes into play. Not necessarily whether they uh, want to give the person a break or not, but if they if it's something where they really feel like someone is um, actively um, uh, disrupting things, or if it's just a, a scenario where they need, might need some help, or they may not, might need some kind of detox facility or whatever else. So that's what I mean by discretion. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Alex. Thank you, Mr. Kurtz. Um, first of all, yeah, thank you very much. I think this is very close to what many of us had in mind when we supported the creation of this task force over a year ago, and it's very clear that a lot of effort's gone into this, and it's, it's definitely appreciated. Um, with specific regard to the public safety sales tax, um, I, I see very little in here that 
isn't appropriate, would not be an appropriate use of the public safety sales tax. Um, unfortunately, as you correctly identify in your uh, in the, the more detailed section of your report, uh, a significant portion of the public safety sales tax is currently uh, uh, dedicated to uh, retirement of building debt. And as you work with uh, Professor Kalmanoff and ILPP in integrating this in, in using this report as one of the things that inform his final recommendations, something that I think will be very important for you and he to work on is providing guidance to the county board in terms of how the recommendations in this report can reduce the need for the county to, uh, can either reduce or eliminate the need for the county to commit additional resources like public safety sales tax to building debt. Um, as time goes by, the numbers in your report uh, with regard to the amount of the public safety sales tax that's earmarked for debt service, I mean, that goes down substantially over the upcoming years as these existing building debts are retired. So, you know, if we take on a bunch of new building debt, there's not going to be any public safety sales tax to talk about programming. On the other hand, you know, if we can get away with a minimal amount of construction, if you can identify ways that we can reduce the cost of existing operations, uh, whether that's, you know, uh, closing downtown jail, whether that's, you know, changing the way we do business to the, to the extent that's within the law and that's acceptable to the elected officials. If you can identify those places where cost savings are going to come from, I think there would be considerable support from the board for increasing that amount of the public safety sales tax from the token amount that's, that's uh, provided for alternative programs now to something approaching the level that you're doing this report. So I guess I'm asking you as you work with Kalmanoff, you know, make sure you're providing us with guidance that shows you know, where that, how we're going to get from that 5% to whatever percentage you think is appropriate. Because one thing is for sure, we don't really have any control over how much money that public safety sales tax takes in. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> do we have any other further questions? Do you want to speak to that? Uh, Ms. Petrie. Well, I'm, so I'm sorry. My, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Michael. I Darlene asked if I wanted to speak to Chris's question, and I'll, I'll throw out I uh, co-authored part of that report. Basically, as, as you can see, the constraints, we'd love to say there is a pot of money that we can use for these things. But as we've seen the last year and a half, as stakeholders have come in, uh, we had our county department heads come in and say, we're aware of some of the research out here. A lot of these are good programs. Uh, some of the pretrial stuff that we have in there, that's actually a NACO, a National Association of County National Program pushing counties to do that. We're, we're aware of some of this. We go to the conferences, but no one has any money to do it. And that obviously is the pitfall in all of this. But what we can say is that uh, with the public safety sales tax, which has been crimped by other budget issues with the county the last several years, most of these programs are designed so that if, if we start doing smarter things in the justice system to either uh, screen, uh, screen out uh, who that we think needs to be in jail waiting for trial or not waiting, or using methods to reduce crime, to, to cut recidivism and keep people from ever showing up at our facilities in the first place. The more that we can do that successfully, the more that that frees up money and creates a virtuous cycle. And so some of these will take up startup funding and it's probably going to take a state pilot program in conjunction with uh, the Department of Corrections or finding some ways to get some federal programming. But if these are successful, uh, if we can reduce the number of people at the jail or use some lower security ways of housing people, when, when the budget goes down, that's money that can be used to work on more programs to try to, try to reduce crime and to have lower, in cap, lower impact jail programs as well. Thank you, Mr. Richards. Ms. Petrie, did you have your hand up? Um, like everybody else, thank you. You all work very hard. It's much appreciated. You have 10 recommendations. Um, are these recommendations in priority? No. Okay, that's <laughs> no. fine. We tried to organize them so they made sense together. Right, grouping them. Yeah. Okay. Um, did uh, the group of you come up with 
two or three that you feel that you would like the county board to focus on as priority recommendations? Well, um, as, as we've tried to implement, Im imply here, um, there's a couple of underlying principles that we think are kind of below everything. One is the restorative justice piece, okay. and that would be start beginning to look at crime in that way. Um, the second one would be some kind of um, funding, because obviously whatever programs we choose, or services we choose, some funding has to be identified okay. for that. And the third one would be the, some way to coordinate or evaluate the success of what we're doing um, through a coordinating council with data collection and evaluation process. So the actual services that get funded, um, obviously we've recommended things we think would work and that will help, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. but there could be others. Um, but those so are those underlying focus is those umbre umbrella issues, right? Okay, and um, I know it's hard um, not to have some other recommendations in mind and just make this nice and succinct with ten. Is there a recommendation that uh, the task force felt was important, but you limited it because you wanted to only present ten? We did. We had a couple of issues that came up. One was okay. that you, we did not address the juvenile issues. Okay. Um, they are, as we've said, they're a little ahead in terms of their way, the progress on restorative justice and other, other things. But there is still work to be done there. Um, so potentially still some work could be done on juvenile issues. And then the, the um, second thing that came up, we actually did make a recommendation, was the racial, racial justice task force. And then the third thing that we thought that we were... Um, that was brought up actually by a public participant, and we realized had we had not addressed at all, which was just an oversight, um, was the issue of the um, the issues of women and parents in the jail. Mm -hmm. And um, again, that goes back to our restorative justice model. We're trying to find a way that, for example, if you're a single mom and you end up in jail for two weeks, that you're not going to lose your children, your home, your job. Um, that there be visitation for your kids, for parents, those kind of things. And so we really didn't address, get into that very much, but um, if we had more time, maybe would have come up with a recommendation about some of those things. Okay, and one last thing on your comment on uh, maybe paying a little bit more attention to the situation of the juveniles in the mm -hmm. community. Could the takeaway from that comment be that it might be worthwhile for the county board to have a conversation on that and even consider a little in-depth study as to what is happening within our community in conjunction with that. I, I know there are a number of programs underway, and I know there are that you oversee mm -hmm. in RPC. So you seem to be a good person to give us some guidance on that aspect. Um, as I mentioned, there are community organization um, coalitions that are already working on those issues, and whether we need another coalition to do that or task force, I'm not sure. Okay. Um, the, but there are, they're not, there is not a single coordinating council for youth issues. Um, there's, there's no thread running. There's no th thread. There's, there's participation of various members running. Like, for example, I belong to a lot of them, or there's community elements representative at most of them, but they're not all the same thing. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Mr. Carter. I'm, I'm trying to figure all this out. <laughs> we have the uh, Community Justice Task Force. Then we have the uh, County Mental Health. Mm -hmm. What are you doing? And cooperating these together? Are we supposed to? Because it seems like to me, why is it that we have a justice system doing mental health? Well, the Community Justice Task Force um, was, form, was forming recommendations, and one of the things we were looking at was behavioral health issues, which involve mental health and substance abuse. And at the same time, the Mental Health Board, um, <coughs> partly, from the, partly from the input from the task force members, um, develop that resolution. So I just brought the resolution for your information. It's not part of our recommendation, but it's just to let you know that the Mental Health Board did adopt the resolution as part of the task force exploring these issues. Well, when are we? I've been hearing these same problems for 50 years. 
Then we never come up with a solution. We always come back with the same problem on the table. And to me, I don't see anything in sight that's going to correct them the way we going. When we should put, we used to have a facility up at Kankakee to take care of the men ill when I was a kid. The police didn't have nothing to do with it. That was the medical system and the community done that. Now we have uh, the jailhouse is supposed to be justice. And we've been had, I see some young people out there now been talking about this for years, but nobody never listened at them to come up with a solution. So I'm saying, when we gonna start to solving these problems and stop just bringing them up on, putting them up on the table? It's ridiculous. And you put them in the right category and give them to the right department to handle them. You're not doing that. So you're fuzzing up the issue. Mr. What Carter. is the Mr. Carter. sheriff going to do with mental health? Mr. Carter, do you have a question for Ms. Uh, that's the Clinton, point, Mr. Chairman. Please. We never can bring out our ideas in this board. Well, that's what we're trying to do here tonight. Well, while we're here, we can't discuss them. Well, this is the doing. problem. Okay. That's the justice that we got, that you're doing right now. We, we'd never solve these problems if we not could bring them up and talk about them. And this is the problem. Why don't we quit bull each other? That's what it is, P.O.D. bull crap. And it's not getting any better. Mr. Carter, it's, please it's be worse civil. It's worse than it was when I was a young man. Would you please be civil? Thank you. I'd appreciate it. We want to listen to your comments. <clears throat> and we know you've been well, here a well, long how time. How can I give him a comment? May what I, time? May I speak, what sir? What place? May I speak, sir? Thank Where you. is the place? Okay. This is the place for discussion. But accusations... Discussing what? Mr. Carter, thank I, you. I'm talking about the criminal justice system. I'm talking about the health system. So what, what's, what's wrong with it? I didn't say there's anything wrong, but I'd like you to see if you, if you can... Mr. Tend, Chairman, like, if you that's the reason we'll be here forever, and the condition will get... No, it won't get any better. It won't get any better. We keep pushing it under the rug. Mr. Carter, we're trying okay. to get it better. Okay. That's the point of all of this. The money we've spent, the time we put in over a year of this task force, and 80 pages of recommendations are trying to straighten out the system that you have major concerns about. And that's exactly what this task force and this board is trying to do today, sir. Okay? That's the point of this program. That's the point of this task force, and that's the point of this report, to work together with the justice system, with the judges, with the, with the state's attorney, and with this county board, and with all entities in this community to better our systems. And that's exactly what we're talking about tonight. And that's why we're trying to move ahead to change those things that you have concerns about. And that's the reason tonight for this report. Well, I just have a, a way, see a way of doing them that I don't see is incorporated in these papers. If you'd like to make some, if you'd like to make some suggestions, send me an email, sir, and we'll post it for the task force. Thank you. Any other questions from the board? Okay. Thank you, Ms. Popa. I really appreciate the task force and all its work, and I know that this is really just the beginning of where we're moving forward, and this is going to be a long-term program. Thank you. Uh, only, is there anyone else who wishes to speak in public participation to this report? If not, I'll just go with these two at this point. Very simply, each person has five minutes to make a statement. There will be no question and answer. This is public participation, and we're asking the public to give us their comments. First gentleman is Mr. Gary Matthews. Would you please step up to the podium, sir, and press the um, button in the middle of the microphone? Thank you. Turn this on. Yes, sir. Just hit the button in the middle. 
You got it. Thank I'm you. I'm on? Okay. Uh, I'm Gary Matthews. I'm a member of the uh, Muhammad Area Youth Club Board of Directors in Muhammad. Uh, I've served on the Don Moyer Board of Directors in the past. I've been a mentor in the Muhammad Seymour School System. Uh, basically, for the last 20 years, I've been involved, been involved with uh, after school early intervention uh, with youngsters uh, before they get in trouble. That's the whole objective of the uh, really the Boys and Girls Club type programs here in Champaign, our own program in Muhammad, the mentoring program in the various schools, and, and there are other programs going. The Urbana has an after school program. Uh, when I read the uh, introduction to the re task force report, I got really excited because it said they were going to identify existing and potential programs and strategies for reducing the risk of Champaign County youth becoming juvenile or adult offenders. And Darlene kind of stole my thunder, be and I have to withdraw my claws a little bit because she said the task force didn't address that issue. Uh, it's uh, I don't take I don't take you know any issue with the recommendations the task force has made. Obviously, a lot of work, effort, time, and, and careful study has gone into that, and the recommendations I'm sure all have value. But my contention is that you've missed a big part of the problem. The problem is getting to kids before they get in trouble. Uh, th these programs work, and they get very little support. Uh, I'm an old man, and my memory may be uh, full <laughs> failing, <laughs> but I believe the quarter cent sales tax, when I voted for it, I don't remember that, you know, I voted for it because it was going to address preventing juvenile delinquency, and I now, you know, find it 5% currently goes, and now you want to divert all of it into one part of the problem, and I don't deny that's a problem, but the other, but the programs that the Don Moyer Club runs, that the Muhammad Area Youth Club runs, that the mentoring programs in Champaign run, these all have positive effects. I, I, uh, Alan, you saw the, the video that we we took here for a recent fundraiser, and uh, John, you've seen that. These are kids. I knew these kids when they started. They were rascally and and, and come from came from very. Uh, disadvantaged environments. They were all at-risk kids. Today, they're productive citizens. Uh, and there are dozens more out there that are serving in the armed forces. They're uh, going to college. They're running businesses. Uh, they're, they're productive citizens in society because adults took the, took the time to intervene before they got in trouble. Once you get kids in trouble, you know, you got to help them, but, but the, the the money is better invested keeping them out of trouble in the first place. And I guess my plea is don't overlook that part of the problem. You've got to look at that before you start spending heaps of money on only part of the puzzle. Uh, the other part is helping kids become all they can be, develop their capabilities, get good mentors, uh, get good adult role models, get them engaged in, in, in uh, enrichment kinds of activities, get them before they get involved with gangs and fall behind in school and, and develop antisocial behavior uh, problems. That's when you, that's where your money gets the best bang for the buck. You got to, you got to address the other part of the problem, but you only have so many dollars to spend. Don't spend it all in one, one problem. That's my plea. Thank you, Mr. Matthews. We appreciate your comments. Uh, Mr. Aaron Ammons. Good evening, 11, Aaron Ammons, 1108 North Busey in Urbana. Do I have to say that at the county board? It's, I don't know. Okay, so um, first of all, I would really uh, want to extend my thanks also to the Community Task Force Committee. Some, uh, some of my good friends, one person I know particularly well, um, <laughs> but the countless hours that are spent outside of work, family life, business, all these other different things to actually put together something that is in depth and that is, you know, that took a lot of time and thought to, to bring forth to this board. And I love to see this type of government in action because 
as you all sit here as elected officials, I know that many of you have the same concerns, so it's difficult to read and be abreast of every single issue that comes across the table for you. So it's imperative that citizens go beyond their vote to actually engage the government and do the things that they're doing. And I appreciate your language, uh, uh, Alex, as you talked about the guidance that may be offered to the board from the citizens. Um, with that said, I'd like to speak to a particular aspect of the recommendations that uh, I feel most comfortable speaking to. Um, that is the system management, in particular as it relates to reentry programs. I'm the president of a, a local organization called Citizens with Conviction, and we are primarily our focus is to deal with helping individuals with felony convictions with reentry into society and to cope with the obstacles that we face. Um, my observation, personal observation, is that the infusing of felony convictions into our uh, into the criminal justice system when with the Thirteenth Amendment has created a monster that all of you have been forced to feed, and so we all uh, sort of subconsciously or consciously create models of punitive ways to deal with situations, to build more prisons, and to house individuals who have made mistakes, as opposed to trusting the human spirit, the human goodness in the individual when given the proper tools, um, education, employment, uh, and those types of things that we need so that we can turn our lives around. I have a felony conviction. I was once one of these wayward youth who was misguided and doing various different things that were not productive. But I understand that with uh, in proper employment at the University of Illinois, with a, a wife who was <laughs> on me all the time about things, various different things helped me pull things together. But employment was the one of the most fundamental keys to that. And so you all are dealing with something right now, a proposal to, to, uh, to build a new jail, but you are part of a larger conglomerate issue uh, where individuals, this vehicle for hire ordinance that's out there that bans individuals from getting employment for four years for a taxi cab, uh, asking, uh, there was a situation where it was just discussed this evening where an individual was offered uh, employment, but his, he couldn't pass the background check because it hasn't been long enough yet. You know, so even when an individual pays that debt to society, they have to continue to pay. This just continues this uh, issue of recidivism, of, of poverty, which leads to crime. And so I'm asking you all, I'm urging you all to trust some of the work that has been put into this. These reentry programs, when uh, guided by especially individuals like myself, Mr. Kilgore, Marlon Mitchell, individuals who have spent a lot of time studying and researching this issue, understand the issue, and can offer individuals something that they don't get typically when they come through a transition program or something like that. So that's just uh, a couple of things that I look at in particular that I think that I would be uh, helpful and instrumental in, in helping function. And uh, I, I would say this to this public safety sales tax, that the... I, I, I can understand where the gentleman is coming from about the uh, the five percent money not being broken up for his juvenile programs. I, I, I agree that Champaign Urbana area project, the community I'm not community elements neighborhood connections, boys and girls club, various different places that get the that that particular those particular dollars. I think they need to continue to get those dollars. I think that if we're all honest with ourselves and we're reasonable, and we're not looking at things from a jailing punitive standpoint, 95% of public safety sales tax to build buildings and 5% towards prevention. That was never a workable, su sustainable model for us to actually expect some positive results from. So, so uh, I know my time is limited. I do think that it's possible for us to find ways, especially if we, we're not looking to spend as much money or, or any money on building a, a, a new facility, that some of this money could be diverted to, to other areas. And I'm very appreciative of all the other different uh, possible pots of money that, that were raised that may not be a direct burden on the county board. I thank you all for your time and all of your service as well. Uh, do we have anyone? There you go. That gentleman would like to speak. Would you just hand it to one of these gentlemen here, and they'll pass it over to me. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Marlon Mitchell.
Good evening, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank once again the task force for uh, putting together the, uh, the research and all, all the recommendations that they have uh, placed before each and every one of them. I think it, was a, it touched and it was a little bit more inclusive than what the ILLP, ILPP put together. Uh, but basically, what I wanted to talk about is the reentry piece that Aaron mentioned. And I've been doing a lot of research and just, just reaching out to different uh, locales and communities and throughout the nation. And um, I know funding is going to be a big piece and it's going to be a uh, discussion about the quarter cent sales tax and where are we going to put these monies. And the reentry piece is very, very important to me, as Aaron mentioned, because when you return from the Illinois Department of Corrections, you're basically given 50 bucks, a bus ticket, and you're put right back into society saying, uh, be productive. Uh, a lot of times there's a lot of barriers there, whether it's housing, employment, different things, old, different things of that nature that become obstacles for people returning. But one thing I wanted to share with you all was uh, an option and the adult redeploy program that's been situated here in the state of Illinois. Uh, I'm not sure if many of you are familiar with it, but I've uh, actually been in contact with several individuals that run the program, and I would like to share an email. Uh, but before I share the email, I'd like to give you an overview or what it's all about. And most of it, uh, the participating counties, there are 11 participating counties in the state of Illinois. Uh, nine, they just added two more uh, at the beginning of this year. But there's 11, and some of these participating counties include Cook County, DuPage County, Fulton County, Jersey County, Knox County, Macon County, Madison County, McLean County, St. Clair County, and Winnebago County. And I do believe there was two more added. I can't think of the names off the top of my head, but uh, I reached out to uh, Miss Mary Ann Dyer several months ago about looking into uh, some funding as far as a reentry program here in Champaign County. And she's the program administrator for uh, adult redeploy here in, uh, in the, uh, Illinois County, I mean, state of Illinois. And I'll just show you with this email when she replied back when I reached out to her what it said. And it says, uh, uh, greetings to you, Marlon. Thank you for your interest in adult redeploy. It would be a wonderful, it would be wonderful to have Champaign County implement a local redeploy Illinois program. We, re we just released the RFP for new implementation sites, which is available on our website. We anticipate having planning grants available for, available for or after July 1st, once we know how much we receive for the, the fiscal year of 2014 state budget. Uh, I said all that to say is because what we have here in Champaign County is an opportunity to be sort of a, uh, a front runner for the next uh, re adult redeploy. Now, most of these funds and most of these counties that I mentioned, the way that they, they're using their redeploy, adult redeploy, is through intensive probation and drug court. A reentry program is something that would be innovative and is very much needed here in Champaign County because the last time I checked, we have over 400, right about 450 uh, uh, persons that are on parole. Each year we have about between four and 400 and 450 people returning to our county annually on parole without the basic necessities or human services that they need to be productive citizens. And once again, we all know how that cycle works with how they end back up in county jail. And me being African-American, I know the figures as far as 67% of us <laughs> when we return from the uh, Illinois Department of Corrections, 67% of us uh, recidivate. So I just want you all to be mindful. I'm not exactly sure. Uh, if you want, you can email me uh, or contact me because I've done a lot of research in the past year and a half on the reentry piece. Uh, but, and also just I encourage you all just to uh, visit that, re uh, that website of uh, Adult Redeploy. Thank you. Thank you, Marlon. <coughs> Appreciate it. Uh, do we have anyone else who wishes to speak in public participation? This gentleman? All right. Come on up, please. And we'll fill out the your form in a moment for you. Come on up, and we'll have someone fill it out. You don't have to start that now. Go ahead, sir. Please uh, get, t tell us your name. Uh, Martin Miller. Um, I, th I thank the task force for what they did for the, this county and for the county board to sit here and listen. Um, 
I'm going to deal with, with the people coming back too to Champaign from the Department of Correction. If we really want to get serious about dealing with the county jail and what's happening in this county, we got to deal with the people that's coming back from prison because um, it, it's really, if you go through the records, it ain't uh, different people going through our county jail. It's the same people coming back, going back to jail because I'm out here in the, in the community and I see it happen. And when they do get here, they, they come with $50. They come with no support. And, and, and we're only spending 5% of the sales tax for, for prevention. And um, as the county board members, y'all can make a better decision than what we got there because to build a new jail, once you build it, you got to fill it. And, and, and when you fill it, it's going to be with minorities. And, uh, and I don't know, they say there ain't, ain't no racism in the community. They keep saying that. But if you look at the numbers, you look at uh, the IDOT study, say the racial profiling is still going up. It's just um, what we see and what you say is totally different. So as the county board members, I want y'all to take what, what these people brought to y'all, take the common sense that y'all have by building a new jail, what it's going to do to this community. It's not, I got my granddaughter here. If y'all build a new jail, I worry about her getting stopped and ending up in the county jail. Because y'all going to, it's going to get filled. So um, instead of building a jail, let's figure out how, how we can take this sales tax that the voters voted that to give y'all to do things with the money, like fix the courthouse, the clock, and give a juvenile center. Then somehow during the, during the time that this tax was taken from them, and decide to do something else. I don't know if all y'all was on the board when it happened. That wasn't even fair to the taxpayers. So if we're going to do anything with that quarter sales tax, let's do it for the people, not for the Justice Department of the city. Let's do it for the people. Let's do the right thing. Thank you. Does anyone, uh, sir, would you please fill out a form and then turn it into us? I'd appreciate it. Do we have anyone else who wishes to speak in public participation? Have you filled out a slip, ma'am? All right, you do that right after your uh, comments. Sure, thank, you. thank you. Please state your name. Mm -hmm. Danielle Shadow with them at 412 West Illinois Street in Urbana. Um, and I hadn't expected to speak today, but I just wanted to make two brief comments. Um, I'm still digesting the task force report. Hey, little guy. Um, and, uh, but first, Thank you, Task Force. It takes a long time to do this kind of work. And it's a really, really important part of what we do is to do vision work and not just the nuts and bolts administrative work. So this visioning and strategic planning work is very important for a uh, long-term vision for criminal justice in our community. Um, so I commend the board for taking that first step. Um, when I served on city council, I, uh, I expected to be very quiet when I first got on city council. And my first meeting, um, 2001, May of 2001, uh, we were looking at the budget. It's, I always wondered why they seat city council members a month before they pass the budget, because it's one of the most important things you do. Um, Chris is laughing because he knows about this. And, but but it, it, it is true. And in that budget was allocation for two school resource officers. And so began a long and lengthy conversation about um, police officers in the school, the criminal justice system, et cetera. Um, I guess what, what I, after that period of time, we did go ahead and allocate funds for two school resource officers. We also started a community dialogue where I met with um, police officers at both Champaign and Urbana for the course of about two and a half years. Hold on, sweets, hold on. For about two and a half years, we, we spoke and talked about specifically how to divert youth from JDC, from the, from the criminal justice system. We talked and we talked and we had fantastic ideas and there was a lot of synergy between both police departments and the council and yet there's very little that we actually implemented in that time. Why? Because we didn't put our money where our mouth is. 
So we had lots of great ideas, we had a lot of strategy, but ultimately, as you know, because you are the stewards of the public money, you're the stewards of our money, just as the council was the stewards of the public's money in Urbana. And so we know that if you follow the money, that's where you find priorities. That's where you know where the priorities of the county board are. So ultimately, I think there's a lot of great recommendations in this piece. We can talk and write reports. It's very important to do strategic planning. And at some point, the difficult question is, are you going to allocate money to make prevention and diversion a priority or not? Where do you want to put your money? And so I would urge you as you as moving forward that that's the piece we're going to look at. What do you put your money? Where do you invest your funds? And we suggest that a fantastic use of funds is in prevention, diversion. We want to see crime rates go down. We want to see, see safety go up. We want to see youth engaged in beneficial activities. And all this is possible. And you have the fund before you. And it's important not just to dump that fund into bricks and mortar, to, but to fund it with people. He does this at home all the time. Thank you. I appreciate your time, and I appreciate your serious consideration of these issues. Thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, Ms. Brooke Lillard, please. Do I have to press anything? Okay, no, I don't. Hi. Um, thank you, Community Justice Task Force. Thank you, Ezra, for your entertainment. Uh, and thank you all for being here and discussing this. Um, this meeting comes the closest to a dialogue that I've seen here at the county board. Um, I'm always really confused about how sometimes the public speaks and sometimes the board speaks, but we're not really supposed to interact with each other, which seems antithetical to the purpose of being here. Uh, I also see that in what Lloyd was bringing up, I thought he was trying to have a dialogue, and so I was very confused that that got shut down. Um, I would be very interested in talking with you afterwards. Um, so in the past year, I've been involved in, um, when I so when I found out, um, I came to a county board meeting, heard um, this person talking about building as though it was something that was about to happen, and I was surprised. Um, building a jail, um, and it was either build a new building or it's attached something to the old building, not will there be building that happens. Um, I guess that really fits with the 95% of the sales tax going to construction sort of model. Um, and so since that meeting, I um, have done um, door to door surveys with a number of people here and um, been at a number of farmers markets, and we've talked to the community here. I've spoken to I haven't counted, but certainly 100 people, more than 100 people, about what they think would make this community safer. And I don't think that I've spoken to anybody who said they thought uh, jail or construction <laughs> were going to do that. Um, the only thing that it, people, people listed uh, preventative services, education, drug rehab, mental health, the same things that this task force has laid out here. Um, and the only thing that counts as construction that I heard uh, people saying would make them safer are street lamps. And I don't think that would take 95% of the public safety sales tax. So I just wanted to share that feedback um, that I have gotten talking to many community members who are not my friends. They're not my peers. They're people that I have met in public places. So um, I think that's significant um, to show that it's a broad sample. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Chris Evans, please. Uh, thank you. I'm Chris Evans, and I'm in District 8. Um, I wanted to first thank, of course, the task force. I want to thank the county board for honoring the citizens' request to have a task force. And uh, to, yeah, seriously. And I really am glad to see the process open up beyond where we were a year ago or two years ago. Um, I want to address the money issue. Um, there's been a consistent uh, re 
reply to the idea of more programming and more good things to increase our public safety, things that would be, might be more effective than putting someone in a cage or land, you know, saddling them with excessive fines, probation fees, court costs, and those kinds of things, impoundments of cars, and of course with jail comes unemployment and you become a tax liability instead of a tax uh, taxpayer. So, and all for rule violations. We have to really look at the way we, I hope this conversation will continue to talk about the way we prosecute in this county and how that could lessen our cost and cr increase our effectiveness toward dysfunctional behavior that we wanna sincerely address. But on the money issue, it's pretty disingenuous of all the law enforcement community and you folks to say we have no money for programming, but we had money last year, and we saw it in the email from Deb Busey to Sheriff Walsh. We saw what was proposed by Tom Betts in the News Gazette, that a 15 to $20 million jail expansion was certainly possible within the use of the public safety sales tax. And as Ms. Busey understands, this county is legally allowed to go into about $100 million in debt. So we've had the money to do uh, we, I don't think the money is an issue. It's just the whether we have the political will to now use the money effectively to actually give the residents of Champaign County what they want, which is a reduction in the incidence of crime. Putting someone in a cage, saddling them with probation for rule violations, for little little things and driving things, and not really addressing what the real person's problem is. You are addicted to drugs you are in need of mental health treatment or whatever it is, that's gonna reduce our, our, uh, our incidence of crime. I'd also like to call to the county's attention that not only do you spend about $27 million a year on law enforcement, but our entire county, when you factor up the police agencies all around here, which, which we have many, including, and I don't even have the Police Training Institute or the Muhammad Police in here, but. I, I count up, when you count up all the budgets, it's $61 million that we're spending every year on law enforcement. We are currently at $45 million in debt because of the criminal justice system. They went on that wild spending spree to build these pretty buildings and the audacity of this county board to now, after 10 years of not spending any money to fix that jail, to this day, we have not had a single motion on this floor for an exterminator in that downtown jail. We have not had one motion on the floor for a light bulb. Now that care takes care of two out of the three problems the NIC had with our jail. Dingy lighting, <laughs> rats and roaches, and uh, poor atmosphere. So I, I, yeah, what, peeling paint. We haven't even talked about it. We haven't had a motion on the floor for a uh, you know, non vaporous gallon of paint. But the sheriff is more than willing to portray that jail and its peeling, little bit of peeling paint on the TV stations every time, but nobody paints it. So use of the money to get what we want, which is a reduction of crime. I don't, I think the money's there no matter what you say. You were willing to go into $20 million in debt last year to build more jail cells. So the, I think that question is over. It's our money anyway. We like to spend it. Law enforcement has had 30 years, 30 years of carte blanche, whatever they want, and the audacity to pass a $300,000 tuck pointing on the courthouse again. Again. That courthouse, by the way, was to, we were told in 1998 that that was a 15 to $20 million project. To this day in 2013, when after, 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 raising $53 million of our taxes, we still owe what? What is it? 20, I'm, I've got it written down here. We still owe tw over $24 million on the courthouse. <laughs> Government at its best, wouldn't you say? So let's relax about the money. Let's do what's effective. And I, I think continued conversation, let's design something good. I'm still willing to hear the sheriff's needs. I think uh, consolidation in one locale might be a more efficient use of time and resources. I don't know, but let's take a look at the whole problem. But let's certainly go get back on task one, and that's reducing the, the incidence of crime, and we've got the money. Thank you.
Thank you, sir. <laughs> Cope Comston. I'm Cope Comston. I live at 1403 South Busey in Urbana. And I also would like to thank you very much and the task force for, for your work and for bringing these issues out into the public. I was on the uh, Human Relations Commission in Urbana for six years and spent years trying to get these issues in the public. And I, it, is, it is wonderful to be talking about the problem. I agree with Mr. Carter. It would be nice if we spend as much time solving the problem. What I would like to talk about is the people that I've seen in jail. I've spent time in the juvenile detention center and have talked to the kids there. I took an essay contest in there and got to talk to the kids about why they were there and what they were doing there. And they weren't able to be in school. They, weren't, uh, they were dying to be engaged. They wanted people to listen to them. They were in jail because they didn't have the money to eat. They had to go out and get their own money to get their own food if they were going to have that. We criminalized poverty, and that, I thought the wording was brilliant in the tax force. We are criminalizing uh, misfortunes that people in this community have, and they end up in jail for things that are truly not their fault. And so the prevention of the social issues is a very good place to start. I spent a considerable amount of time in the county jail working with books to prisoners as a librarian going in once a week and hearing the stories of the people who were in there simply because they didn't have a driver's license, they couldn't pay their fine, they lost their job, they missed their kids. We helped them address Valentine cards to send to their kids so that they could have contact with them because these people are crying out to be whole citizens here. And it would be so simple to keep those people out of jail with some of the recommendations in this task force about, uh, you know, whatever it is, monitoring them, finding safe ways for them to be in the community. These are not violent offenders. Many of the people in the county jail, they're losing hope because they're being uh, held in you know, they're, they're being made useless. They're being made ineffective. They're taken away from their families. They cannot be whole people. And what they're learning is that they're not worth being whole people. So the prevention, keeping them out of the jail for the nonviolent crimes, I think this is a wonderful place to just, it would be very easy to put some of these recommendations in effect very soon and keep, get these people out where they need to be, which is living their lives. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I don't have any more slips at this time for public participation, so I'm going to close public participation. Before we adjourn, I'd like to say to the community at large, thank you. Each and every one of you who showed up tonight, whether you spoke or not, has an interest in the safety and security and welfare of our community. And I want you to understand something. This is not an empty <clears throat> meeting that we're just going to listen and then walk away. I can tell you, as chair of this board, I take this extremely seriously. The work that's been done by ILPP and the work that's done by the task force is something that needs to be done, that needs to be acted on, and that needs to be corrected. And I want to thank each and every one of you who have participated in this. And I want you to know that you can hopefully look towards this county board in the future for acting on the recommendations of this task force. Thank you, and I'm asking for an adjournment. So moved. So moved by Mr. James, second by Mr. Mitchell. All in favor? We're moved. Thank you so much.